to hey guys welcome to metal this is a uh, metal mentoring this is where we get to hang out with one of the super metal guys and learn from their knowledge so we of course can become better as who we are i met dave asprey before he was known as dave asprey he was he was a he looked like a giant chocolate chip cookie he had lots of little bubbles going on he was thick and he was a tech nerd who is grumpy he looks sick and he was one of those guys that you go there's something there i don't know what it is and something miraculously changed dave turned into the superhuman dave asprey that he is today the biohacker how many books five books dave six uh i think six yeah six right and i'm on deadline for number seven and you also co wrote one with your wife uh, the first one yeah well yeah. i give her i give her writing credits but don't you tell her writer credits <laughs> and uh Let's actually start with that. By the way, guys, you got questions or ideas, put them inside the chat. I'll make sure you're unmuted. Dave, let's just talk about that catalyst that changed you, that said, I can't live the way I am. But can you be a little more descriptive about that Dave that you were? All right. So suffering is a really good motivator for change, just, just to be super clear on that. So I was not just fat, like if you're fat, you know it. And if you're not fat and you just have an extra 10 pounds, you still know it. It's not like anyone has to tell you. It's not like there's no voice in your head that tells you that. And then you, you kind of just get beat down because no matter what you do, it doesn't work. But seriously, I like had a girlfriend or whatever. Like, you know, you can replace, I'm going to be really rude. You can replace that, oh, I, I don't have abs. You can replace that with a bank account. It works very effectively and has throughout all of history. All right, so let's just say it like it is. So it's not just about abs, although everyone like, you know, I want to feel good. I'd, I'd like to like my body. But when your brain stops working, you're like, God, I just wake up. I feel like I'm hungover. I didn't even get to drink. I just feel hungover. Like what's going on? That, that sense of helplessness where the, the pedal is all the way to the, to the ground and I'm slowing down and you can push harder, but your car won't go faster if it's slowing down and it's pegged out. And if you wake up and you, you're like, I spend half my life like that. Right. And I know I'm smart and I know, you know I'm at this, this company, the, the company that held Google's first servers. I made 6 million bucks when I was 26, lost it when I was 28, but I was slowing down. I'm like, I should be accelerating and my brain isn't working. And that scared the shit out of me to be perfectly honest. So I said, all right, uh, I'm just going to have to hack this because the doctors are not helpful. They, I go in and they say, maybe you should lose weight. I'm like I worked out an hour and a half a day, six days a week. I ate a low fat diet. It doesn't work. And it was just that I'm going to commit myself to doing what works. And it's my most important priority ahead of anything. And to this day, you ask my assistant, what's the order of priority? Dave's health, right? That comes first. And after that, at a very close second, comes my family, because I can't take care of my family if I'm on my back, right? And then the third thing that comes behind that is work and all the other stuff, you know, community and, and things like that. But, but if hey, I'm not taking hey, care hey, of this, hey. it doesn't work. Dave, don't take this wrong, please. But you were a dick back then. You know, I'm an even bigger dick now. And as well, a result of that, no, I actually not. just send ninjas you're, to your house. You, 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 had, <laughs> you had an attitude. Um, you had, had something. Was that a protective me mechanism, you think? You know, the ego. And so this, this comes, you know, later in my, my body of writing and research and all that stuff. I've been to Nepal and Tibet and studied meditation with the masters and did ayahuasca 20 years ago before school. I had a lot of like personal development learning stuff to do. Um, and a lot of entrepreneurs in the beginning of their career, they are driven by a desire to prove themselves, which is also stated as a desire to not fail. So you're running away from failure. You're trying to prove you're good enough. And that by definition will make you act like an asshole. It's just how it is. Right. Uh, you didn't have kids back then. You were I didn't have kids back then because uh, the woman that I chose to marry was too crazy to have kids with. And I knew it. And I stayed married for five years. And it's one of the reasons I became interested in personal development. I'm like, why, why did I do that? <laughs> like, that was a terrible idea. But something in here that wasn't me, or if it was me, it was an invisible part of me that I can't see, that made me do that. And then what? you're like, oh, why did I lose that six million bucks? Ego. You know, why did I make almost every bad decision I ever made because my body without my conscious knowledge was trying to keep itself alive. And what were some of the mistakes you made back then that may, may, maybe many of us are doing now that we think it's helping ourselves either getting in shape or personal development that we're doing wrong. What common things do you see? Well, that you did? one of the most common things is that we assume that that dose is linear. So, Hey, if exercise is good for you, 
I should run a marathon. In fact, I should run a marathon every day, right? And that actually doesn't work. People who do super high levels of what we call chronic cardio now are at higher risk of stroke and heart attack and a bunch of other stuff like that. Um, they tend to lose their hair. They tend to have joint problems and they actually age more quickly than they should. And if you don't believe me, show me a 60 or 70 year old person who's been doing marathons or triathlons for 20 years or more. And man, these are some beaten up people, right? So does that mean they're bad for you? I would argue, yeah, actually they probably are. But if you want to do one to show that you're in charge of your willpower then go for it. But as an annual self-flagellation pilgrimage, they don't work. So one of the things people do is they say, okay, um, if exercise is good, I'm just going to do it every day for an hour and a half. Like I did when I was in my early twenties, trying to lose that hundred pounds. And what happens is you get overtrained and entrepreneurs, it drives me nuts. And I've coached a bunch of them. I put them through my brain training program, you know, where we get really deep on psychology and, and using electrodes to, to show you when you're telling yourself a lie or not. And they'll come in the door, you know, I've started this company, I funded this other company, and I'm flying to Japan, I just got in here, I'm on my jet, and I'm gonna do a, a triathlon or Kona, and my goal is to be a CrossFitter, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, let me guess, you sleep like shit, and you have uh, no libido. And like, how did you know? I'm like, well, <laughs> it's called overtraining, or too much stress. So all stress, whether it's business, relational, um, you know, from what you're having at home, uh, from any kind of disease or sickness or from fasting or from not sleeping or from jet lag, all those stresses, they're just stress. And that can also just come from lifting stuff, right? So what those do is this add up. And if there's too much of that stuff, you end up with lower testosterone, higher cortisol, higher adrenaline, and then you'd stop showing up the way you want and you act like a dick. So when you go back to the reason I acted like a dick a lot of the time, I thought I was, I thought I knew a lot. And actually the truth is I did. Like I, I was, I called a whole bunch of stuff right. Uh, and I ran strategy for a $36 billion company. And I got to attend board meetings, even though I wasn't allowed to talk. And I was like 26, like, okay, that's kicking ass. But so I'm like, yeah, look at me, you know, I'm, I'm a big deal. And my interpersonal skills were pretty limited, right? Because, uh, well, if, if all you care about is your money and success and not failing and making sure everyone knows that you didn't fail, you know, that's basically response to childhood trauma or bullying. And most entrepreneurs were bullied, the ones who do that. And when you switch to being actually mission driven, and that's different. You got to do some digging on what is your mission. Um, and then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, that's not why I do what I do. I was going to start Bulletproof as a nonprofit. The only reason it was a for-profit company is my nonprofit board of directors argued with me for three months about the, the URL. And so I basically said, I'm doing this myself. <laughs> I, had, I was making a quarter million a year at Trend Micro as VP of cloud security. I flew around to five-star hotels and gave talks. It's not a bad life for a new dad. Um, I started the company to help people and still why I do what I do. It's, it's very it's like, different motivation and it makes me act less like a dick, I think. It's like you and Tim Ferriss came out around the same time. You know, this is creepy, but Tim's very first company came out in around um, 2002-ish and it was a supplement, cognitive enhancer for college students. And in 2001, I was in Wharton doing the executive uh, MBA program where they fly the professors out to San Francisco so you don't have to go to school there. Um, and my like the equivalent of a thesis was cognitive enhancement substances for college students. And the only reason I didn't launch the company is because I decided to get divorced instead. But when I found this out like 10 years later about Tim, I'm like, oh my God, like are we long lost brothers or something? I don't know. Um, but uh, that mindset there around improvement is there um, and cognitive enhancement is real. And I'll tell you guys, if you're not taking nootropics, <laughs> Like, seriously, you make your money with your brain. Your willpower is based on not just your brain, but the cells in your body. And if you take the right nootropics, if you just get 10% better, can you get 10% in the bank account on any of your money right now? No. Buy some nootropics. Guys, <laughs> like 50 let, bucks. You can do it. <laughs> let's open this up, guys. You got a questions, comments, or ideas, something you want to share with Dave. The chat is open. Pop them in there, and I will unmute you. Um, Teddy, I'm not going to use this as a, one of your questions because I know you're going to come up with other ones later on. What's the uh, next book about? That's what Teddy's asking. Um, the next book is around fasting. And a lot of people don't, uh, don't know this unless they're longtime Bulletproof fans, but the Bulletproof Diet, published 2014, it was the first major book on intermittent fasting, which is a component of it. It was the first major book to talk about lectins and this inflammatory plant compounds that are messing with you and a couple others that haven't hit the mainstream yet. Um, and so it was also one of the books in, on Google Trends, you'll see like keto started spiking right after the blog and the book came out. Um, and so what I found over 
a long time keeping the 100 pounds off from 10.3% or thereabouts body fat without particularly amazing, like I don't have to exercise to maintain that. Um, what I found is that people are fasting wrong. And I've fasted for long periods of time, I've intermittent fasted, and people don't understand what it is or how to do it. And a lot of the common misconceptions that even the big name fasters are doing, they actually don't work for guys like you and me. Because guess what? We're not health influencers. Well, I might be, but you're probably not. So what that book is about is here's how you actually fast to get shit done <laughs> instead of like fast because it makes you cool. We're going to buy the book. Don't worry about that. But can you give us some just high level stuff? Well, fasting means to go without, right? And you have to be strategic and targeted. So in the book, I read about, hey, I fasted from humans for a while. You've probably heard about dopamine fasting from Cameron Seppa, who's a friend. I'm actually an investor in Cameron's new company that you're all probably going to end up being customers of because they will be able to enhance your testosterone. But um, the idea of uh, fasting, it can be fasting from just one class of foods that do a certain thing to the body. It could be fasting from anything. It could be fasting without water. So how do you choose which compounds you take during a fast? So you're still fasting, but you actually were better than you were before uh, versus I got hangry and hypoglybitchy. Uh, at you know, 11 o'clock. So I yelled at my staff and you know, got in a fight with my wife at 5 p.m., but I made my fast. Yay. Got it. Let's go to Teddy. Teddy Saunders, you've got the first question on the box. What's going on, Teddy? Hey, Dave. Uh, on, uh, uh, glad to have you here. Oh, I can uh, see the enthusiasm, Teddy. It's overwhelming. It really is. Well, he started talking, so I didn't know if he was saying something. No, I didn't realize Teddy was going to read his question. I thought he just wanted me to answer his question, so I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, I want people oh, to read the question. Well, I can, I can give you an example of why I asked it. Um, I take phenyl poly, polyparazetam. I know you take that and modafinil sometimes when you're going hardcore on things, but I find that sometimes, um, you know, the next day I'm feeling quite burnt out and I think, Oh, am I like, am I, is my energy going up? And then, you know, the universe can't make me invincible all the time. And then it has to bring me down the next day. And I want to ask you if do you ever feel like burnt out, if you're doing too much of it uh, and how do you manage, you know, multiple days in a row, do you do it every day or do you give yourself rest periods? So if I'm feeling burnt out, I just run a marathon to show myself I can do it. You oh, just sure. have to man up. No, uh, no. <laughs> I had to say it. So um, here's the deal. If you're feeling burnt out the day after nootropics, they probably weren't the right dose or you didn't have a cofactor. So my guess is phenylparacetam is, is really amplifying. My guess is you're probably low on acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, because phenylparacetam increases the burn rate of that. So if you were to take some CDP choline, and I'm going to recommend this just because, well, I did formulate it, so I believe in it. It's called Smart Mode. It's a bulletproof product. It will not change my life if you buy my stuff or you don't. I'm just saying it's well formulated. It has some choline in it. Um, some people like to take another form um, of choline besides CDP choline. There is better evidence for that one than the other thing called alpha GPC. So I would just tell you CDP is in Charlie David phosphorus, whatever you would say, Peter, uh, choline. And if you do that, and with modafinil, modafinil is the limitless pill. It's a prescription drug. I took it every day for eight years. I was on Nightline for it. It like, entered the biohacking realm uh, because it was a topic of national conversation for a while there. Uh, and I was the only guy who didn't have a bag on my head on the, everyone else. Like I wouldn't admit it. I'm like, yeah, I took it in school. I couldn't graduate warden without modafinil. Every one of you should have a, a modafinil in your travel bag. So when you land and you're jet lagged or you drank too much the night before and you're just plastered and you have something that's mission critical, you can wake up and do it. it it's not a stimulant. It's much better for you than Adderall, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and How often do you take it, Dave? How long? I mean, can you take it daily? You can. And a lot of people take it for ADHD or ADD. And a lot of entrepreneurs do have that. If so, you know, talk to your doctor about it. Um, you can take, they say they sell 100 and 200 milligram pills and you can do up to 400 milligrams a day. I think people should start at 50 milligrams and see how you feel. And it just, it, it, it makes it easier to pay attention. But it also, I, I kind of think it's like the ever so much more so spray. If you ever remember that, that book from when you might have read when you were a kid, it's a spray that you spray on something that makes it ever so much more so whatever it is. So you spray it on something, it's, it's, you, you wanted it to be a lubricant, but now it makes it more squeaky. So if you're a little bit of a dick and you take modafinil, you're going to be a really amplified dick because everyone around you is suddenly so slow and stupid, right? And if you're a little bit anxious, you might be more anxious, right? So it's, it's an amplifier of you. 
And, and that's important to understand. That's why I like start slow on this stuff. Otherwise you're just like, good God. Like I've never been around so many muggles in my entire life. I don't understand it. And like, that's cause you just got faster and they didn't get slower. It's interesting. It says, uh, it's a stimulant. It can help treat narcolepsy, sleep apnea, and shift work sleep disorder. Those are the prescribed things. It's a well-known cognitive enhancer. In fact, in my second to last book in Game Changers, I wrote a bunch of the science about smart drugs. In the studies on modafinil, it is probably the first pharmaceutical that is well-proven to enhance cognition, um, memory, um, uh, reaction speed in the brain. And I believe that having taken that every day for eight years, plus all the neurofeedback and other stuff I do, um, that my brain just got used to running faster because there's a measure of brain response that falls as you age. It falls on a very linear line. My brain response time to audio and visual stimulus is exactly the same as the average 20 year old. And I'm 48. And what do you think we should take? What's the, uh, the dose? I think you should, uh, smart mode is the bulletproof one. Right. And phenyl paracetam, P-H-E-N-Y-L it is going to do that. Got it. All right. Let's go to our Oh, next. And there's something from Jeff here that's really cool. All right, guys. Are you, going, um, are you going way out of order is what you're doing? I, this is just relevant to what we're saying. So okay. it's, it's a natural flow and then we're going to go back, but it's just a little comment. And what Jeff says is that if you take a prescription medication, if you apply for life, disability, long-term care insurance, they could come back to haunt you. Yes. Um, same thing if you decide you're going to use uh, nicotine as a cognitive enhancer, anti-aging substance, which I'm an advocate of, not smoking, but microdose nicotine. Um, I would say for any of the drugs, if you get them not from your normal doctor, <laughs> you're probably going to be happy about that because I did disclose all my stuff and also any hallucinogens or psychedelics you use. If you disclose that even one time in a doctor's appointment five years ago, they're going to find it and they're going to torture you for it and they're going to try and raise your rates. Um, so I have taken all sorts of weird pharmaceuticals. I'd explain every one of them and argue and my underwriters you know, went in and fought. I, my life insurance is like $50 million because my investors required it. So um, um, it, was, it was traumatic, let's just put it that way. So yes, um, you should be a little bit on the down low for some of these, but the plant ones, you're fine. Let's go to Ken Dubner. Ken. Hey guys. Hey, I don't know why. I, oh, wait. Uh, what? What is he, what is <laughs> I just see the K. Buddy? Yeah, K, I got my thing on. Here we go. Bing. Bang. There we Boom. go. All right, Ken, uh, what's going on, buddy? Hey, man, I just had a comment that I'm doing my thing at 2.15 uh, for people that are no, into brain no, training. No, no, Ken, come on. That was it. You saw me on the thing. I didn't ask a question. Uh, but you don't have a question. You're talking to the top brain expert in the world, body hacker. I would love to expert. talk to him about that. I didn't want to take it off topic. Uh, I'm a hypnotherapist. What's your, what's your understanding of the cognitive end of things? You mentioned brain training, which got my attention. I used to be called a brain trainer. Uh, sure. You said you have a course that trains people's brains. Can you tell us a little about it? Uh, yeah. So 40 Years of Zen is a five-day neurofeedback-based program, and we built new hardware and software that measures the electricity coming off the brain and shows you what's going on inside the brain. And as you know, as a, as a hypnotist or hypnotherapist, that there's a message that plays in most people's heads that they don't know about. They believe their story to be true, Right. When you're using the tech that we developed, and, and there's a bunch we didn't develop, but there's stuff that increases voltage in the brain, increases neuron firing speed, tunes networks. It's like dining race car mechanics for your brain. But the first three days of it is actually almost like a lie detector. So you sit there and go, oh, what's that about? And, and you tell yourself your story, but the computer shows you that you're lying. And then you get all pissed off when you realize, good God, pretty much everything that I hold to be true in my reality was probably based on some bullshit story I got when I was a kid. And you go through and you edit that shit out. So then, oh, wow, I know I'm playing on a, a playing field that's actually the real playing field instead of deciding that guy doesn't like me and you know, she doesn't want to go out with me and this board member is doing something they're not doing, all these weird stories. So um, just to, to be, have a real clear sense of reality, it drops the amount of electrons, the amount of energy that goes into garbage thoughts. And a cognitive behavioral therapist is going to teach you, accept the garbage feelings acknowledge them using your damned energy that should go to something good. And then they're going to say, and then just accept it. Let it wash through you and know the feelings will happen and you're helpless to change them. And I'm like, fuck that. 
right? You can change those and hypnotism is a great way to do it. So look, tell your brain that that stupid story that's playing back and forth is not correct. And then you don't have to let the dumb emotions wash through you. And then you don't have to sit in the boardroom and go, I feel like I want to kill that guy, but I'm not going to show it. I'm going to smile. Everyone in the room freaking knows that you're smiling and that they also know that you want to kill the guy. You're not hiding it because we feel it. We feel it right here. So that's why it's so important. You got to drop the amount of energy that goes into bullshit stories in your brain. And if What's we the name of that, that program, that, Dave? Great. You what? What's the name of it? It's 40 years of Zen, 40 years of Zen.com. And just warning, it's five days. It's 10 hours a day. There's an executive chef. It's at a mansion. There's a team of mechanics working on you and your brain. Um, and I mean, it, it'll, it'll work out <laughs> for sure. Yeah. You're, you're going to be busy at the end. Thanks. Ken. How is that? Oh, you're no, it's okay. Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead, Ken. How is that different than, um, you know, Scientology does the little cans and stuff with the e-meter and it oh, gives you an emotion of, and your emotion uh, comes up? There's all kinds of stuff with Scientology. They're just using basic, basic feedback. They're, they're measuring the stress response off your skin. All of you can learn to, to measure when you're stressed and you didn't know it just by looking at electricity on your skin. It's like an, a, it's a 1970s technology. Wait, wait. Are you saying the e-meter is not real? Stop that. No, hey. the the let's e-meter not, is absolutely let's, 1970s let's not, feedback technology. Guys, let's, not touch, let's not talk about Scientology. I don't want them to hunt us down. Hey, um, I want to go to uh, Robert Richmond. Robbie. Okay. Hey, Robbie, can you do me a favor? Can you unmute your camera, please? Yeah, what's up? Buddy, let's talk about real quick. Let's talk about the idea of placebo. And Dave, we're going to talk about placebo. So do you guys, have you guys ever met? Are you getting, we were on yeah. the playa this one time, and he was wearing nothing but a tutu. But other than that time... <laughs> So, at the, you know about the blue pill. So, yeah, he's um, been on my show. Talk, talk about real quick um, about the placebo of the blue pill, and then let's talk about placebo when it comes to actually uh, hacking ourselves. Robbie, talk, talk about the blue pill. Uh, well, it's actually a purple pill. Imagine purple pill. rather than waking up and finding yourself on a spaceship after taking the red pill, uh, why not take both the red pill and the blue pill at once? Put them together, purple, you got the X pill. Uh, so the idea with this is there's a lot on placebo science. I won't go deep into that. It's, it's really a lot about the relationship and everything surrounding the placebo. But I think what I found most interesting about it is how the, um, it's a symbol. It's, a, it's an archetype. And a pill is a symbol of change. We take it to go from any kind of change state to a different type of state. Um, that's a, a lot of times what we're doing with the nootropic. So it symbolizes change in state, but it also symbolizes commitment. Because once you swallow it, you can't take it back. So it's one thing to say you're committed to something and to do something. It's another to literally put that intention in a pill and swallow it because whatever subconscious blocks or fears are there will suddenly manifest and can either clear quickly or become very clear quickly what they are. So that's what I think is really happening with the X pill, the purple pill. Yeah. So Dave, let's go with that direction. A lot of things you talk about us taking, could there be a placebo that's making us feel that way? There's 100% a placebo effect on everything that you do. It's around 30, 32%. Robbie, you want to enlighten me on 28%? What's the number we believe now for placebo? Oh, geez. I mean, it depends because in, in you know, what, what the study is with like the depression ones that are that, that type of mental state, it's up to like 50%. So, so it's, it's pretty crazy. It depends on what you're doing. But in the pharmaceutical business, if you're 10% better than placebo, which means you work a little bit more than half the time, um, great. You got a big winner. If you're 8% better, they'll actually let you sell that thing. So placebo is huge, right? I will tell you that for the, the stuff that I know the mechanism of action for that's believable, like brain octane oil, coffee, bulletproof coffee, very specifically when it's blended the way I talk about it, it people have lost a million pounds on that diet. You, you, you cannot create sustainable placebo effect for long periods of time. It's very difficult to do that. Maybe you can with hypnosis, but um, that stuff works and the pathways are well understood. You measure all the changes and it just works over and over and over. Um, there's other stuff where like I've been through shamanic training. I write about ayahuasca ceremonies, you know, 20 years ago and holotropic breathing and some out there stuff. And you know, why would you go on a vision quest? Yeah, but Robbie said it right. Robbie said it, it, it's commitment. Yeah. That's the key. So as long as there's real commitment, the intent is going to make the change. But Robbie, exactly it's awesome right. to see you here. Seriously. Thanks. I love seeing you hang out with us. Hey, uh, Dave, how are, you, how are you shooting this? What are you doing? What, what kind of camera are you using? Um, this is a Canon EOS 5D Mark IV. It's you just got about, one. You what? Yeah, just got this one to do exactly what you're doing. And you're oh, using nice. what software? 
Uh, I'm just using, uh, actually you can't on a Mac uh, use any software to do it. So what I'm doing is I have an external HDMI converter that goes from, US, uh, from HDMI in to USB out. So awesome. it's made by Magewell, M-A-G-E-W. Nikolai just says it looks really good. Oh, <laughs> thanks man. Uh, and guys, I, just, yeah. I gotta tell you, you should all have one of these. Uh, it's, it's not a trivial setup. You have to change like 10 settings on the camera to get it to work and you plan three, four hours. But after you do that, like watch what I can do. I can, I can step back here and I can talk. And you see how it's auto focusing on me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it has that face follow stuff. You can zoom in, you can zoom out and you look better than everyone else. And if you're running Windows, you can actually have like digital makeup that makes you look all pretty like you do on Zoom. But Zoom does it for you anyway, so who cares? Let's, let's go. <laughs> oh, also, Canon just came out with their uh, a beta software that that's now connecting it all. I'll post that link in the chat. Only here. for Windows. It's not available oh, for really? Mac unless it came out last night. Okay, I'll check. All right, let's go to Dan. Dan, what's your question? Hey, Dave. Thanks for spending time with us this afternoon, man. Um, I'm super happy to be here. I was I'm, just going to ask, what's the, what are like one or two main differences between? Um, like the keto diet and the bulletproof diet and then what carbs can you eat on the bulletproof diet and why? Oh, I love it. So the keto diet's been around since the seventies. It's called the Atkins diet. And it basically means don't eat a carb <laughs> and don't eat too much protein has gotten into it. But there's something that I call dirty keto. And it sort of pisses me off that some of my work has been, um, has been pushed in that direction. I lost 50 pounds on the Atkins version of Dirty Keto uh, in the early 90s. The other 50 pounds took 10 years of work to lose because when you eat fats that are the wrong fats, when you eat proteins that are inflammatory and you eat artificial sweeteners, um, it'll jack you up. You'll actually get inflammation from the fats, from the proteins, but you've already lost some weight. You already got the power of ketones, so you get stuck. You're like, well, it's probably because I had 16 carbs instead of 12, and you fall on this path of like never ending keto. And you know what never ending keto does? Well, it hits women first. It ruins their sleep, their hormones, and their hair. And then for men, it does the same thing. It just takes us a little bit longer. And when I did the full on hardcore, you know, two grams of carbs religiously a day uh, for three months, my sleep stuff, this is going back to when I was testing out the Bulletproof diet. So this must have been, you know, 2010. Um, my sleep score on the, the headband I used to use back then before I could get a ring was uh, 12 times a night I was waking up with no recollection of it and I woke up feeling hungover all the time. Every single client I've ever worked with one-on-one, -on -one, and I don't really do that anymore, who went keto and stayed keto has exactly the same experience. And you can, you can push it out longer by eating the garbage fats uh, and eating garbage proteins. So you see a keto product made out of wheat gluten because it's a protein or milk protein isolate because it's a cheap protein. A, proteins aren't that good for you when you're on keto. You need fats. And so they say corn oil, canola oil, or just coconut oil, which just isn't, you can't live on coconut oil. It doesn't work that way. So the difference between keto and Bulletproof is Bulletproof tells you it must be cyclical. You have to go in and out. It's largely plant-based without the inflammatory plants. It requires grass-fed, otherwise you don't eat it because you won't lose weight and you get the wrong fats from eating industrially raised meat. So um, those are some of the differences, but it's cycle in and out because that's what works for the body and that allows you to maintain good, healthy gut bacteria. And you amplify your ketones with brain octane oil. It's a type of MCT. There are different types that do different things. And that type allows you to stay in ketosis even if you eat some carbs. And I tell you to eat carbs at least a couple times a week. Well, what kind of carbs? Give me some carbs that are okay. Sweet potatoes work for a lot of people. White potatoes work for a lot of people if they're not sensitive to them. And my favorite one is just white rice. And you're saying white rice, not brown rice. Dude, brown rice, every culture who eats rice on the, on the surface of the earth knows that if you can afford it, you eat the white rice. And only the peasants who can't afford white rice eat brown rice. And the reason you take off the outside of the rice is it has 80 times more arsenic than, than the white rice. And it has a bunch of other anti-nutrients. And sure, it has fiber, but who cares? If I gave you some cyanide covered in fiber, would you eat it because it had fiber? Like, it's just a bad idea. So rice is a source of starch when your body needs some starch. So you can get your glucose up and let it drop. Get your glucose up and let it drop. Or more your glycogen than your glucose. So um, I would just say, you know, occasional carbs, not too many. And when you're not in ketosis, you can still be on a low carb diet, which will maintain you forever. And that's what I'm on right now. I probably had, let's say I didn't eat until right before this one o'clock. So I was intermittent fasting. I probably had about 50 grams of carbs at lunch. 
Right? Do you have a fasting window you work with? Yeah, I usually do at least 16 hours, uh, okay. sometimes 18. I don't know. I, I didn't get that much sleep last night. So let's see what you guys know what th those are. It's a continuous yeah, glucose monitor. It's another thing to do. If you want to just own your biology, if you're the kind of person who comes to metal, get one of these. You can get them from your doctor. You wave your phone over it or something else, and it'll show you a glucose score. This is in Canadian or European units. But what, what it'll do is it'll show you, oh, I'm starving. I'm so hungry. And you're like, my blood sugar is 110. I'm actually not starving at all. There's plenty of energy in there. My body is lying to me. I wonder why. Right. And then you're just like, I'm not going to eat until I actually need to. And then your blood sugar goes down and say, all right, I'll eat a little bit. And then it goes back up and you actually learn to, to actually have a control system that you didn't know existed. And that will change your life. One of my business partners and one of my businesses, the mold spray company, um, we make a probiotic you spray around your house to stop toxic mold. Um, he lost 17 kilos, whatever that is, like 40 something ish pounds in the last three months by getting one of these. Because he was basically telling himself stories that he was hungry when it wasn't true. It's just a mind thing. Hey, we got a bunch of filmmakers and incredible people in the group. And yep. one of them is Michael Kaliski. Michael, I, you're going to ask the same question because I want to make sure we all write it down. What's your question, Michael? <laughs> Wait, or, yeah, you're leading me with thinking that I had a, a specific question in mind. But, uh, well, I did, I did just read your, your uh, book, Game Changers, and I, I got a lot of value out of it. Uh, one of the best things I got from it was, was the, um, you know, just taking care of yourself first, making Thank sure you. that you're optimized so that you can do more good in the world, which is what my company does. But uh, Ken, can, can you feed you me a little more You want to know about the camera setup again. You want to know about the oh, setup. Oh, well, somebody, somebody texted me the whole, uh, the whole deal, but yeah, that but was me. from your- That was you. Know, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, and so, uh, so I, I already clicked the websites open, ready for me to explore it later. Um, I don't know what, what uh, yeah, if you can uh, just repeat what your setup is. Uh, well, you know what, let's, let's take this one step further. Um, I was just in Arizona the last couple of days, and let me just tell you, if anyone here is outside California, New York, or Illinois, the world is walking around without masks on. It feels like it's a, it was, people were friendly. What are we looking at? I, you're looking at my camera on my other camera. Oh, got it. Okay, you're showing your setup. I'm just using it like a mirror, so if you guys want to see what the Canon's like, let's see if I can get this right. It's also a very shallow depth of field on that yeah, lens. It's all about the lens is what makes him look so good. The what I was going to say camera. is, you if you that, I was in Arizona 70. and people are walking around happy without masks on, friendly, whatever. But the lockdown, I think, is temporary, but I don't think Zoom is. I think we're going to do more and more of this. Do you agree with Dave? Do you think you see yourself doing more? I, I couldn't do more. I, I started a hundred million dollar company and, and ran it living on an island. I've been on Zoom like six hours a day for years. That's just how I run the business. And I hate Zoom. Um, but yeah, but you are again a leader. So you're what the future is. Do you think the rest of the world's going to follow? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think so. I mean, it kind of sucks like your event industry, your total conference industry got destroyed because of this. It did. You know what I really think is going to happen if this sticks and we, and what my prediction is that a bunch of fear mongering government people are going to make all sorts of regulations that kill events and kill restaurants in general. Like, oh, you can have an event at, or you can have a restaurant and everyone has to be six feet apart, which means the whole model's broken and it is just dumb. So when that's gone, what will happen is you're going to have a camera like this or a good camera. You go to a little studio, they're going to take a 3D picture of you, make an avatar, and you're going to put VR goggles on. And the VR goggles are going to look at what your eyes are doing. And then they're going to stitch a picture of your eyes onto your digital avatar. And you're going to be able to go to a conference. And if you guys have never like spent a couple hours playing Oculus Rift, um, whatever game you like there, it's good enough right now that if I could put that on right now and I could see everything I was seeing right now, I'd probably be in that most of the day, whether I liked it or not. There you go. And that's, that's going to be our homework environment. But with that, I'd go to a conference in a minute because you could say, I'm going to go over there. You click a button, you just teleport over there. And then you can talk to people. You can do all that sort of stuff. So I'm actually kind of hopeful that VR is going to get a boost from this. Uh, but you in the meantime, we're all going to sit at home and look what, You should go check out what Marco Tempest is doing. Uh, his, his, he did an event for us a couple of weeks ago. He's a metal member. And he's doing it for Accenture. And it's their virtual office environment all around vr it's pretty amazing oh, neat. let's go to our one of our younger metal members and that's thomas ma thomas what's your question for dave asprey hi dave i'm thomas um my question to you is what advice do you have for building a brand for a product um throughout this pandemic 
Um, I think it would be the same as building a brand any other time. Uh, focus on doing something that works that's different. Right. There's so many people say, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. There's a good idea. I think I'll copy it. it. I'll feel safer if I do what everyone else has done. And if I can just get, you know, 2% market share, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. No, you're actually a, cough, a copycat, a parasitic vulture. Uh, so go to a new environment that doesn't have something in it. That means a new geography, a new, a new set, a new idea, and, and talk about it. I will tell you from, from experience, Bulletproof is, uh, uh, we're in five major product categories. Three of the five, we created the product category and they're all $100 million product categories. So you can do that and you can scale it as long as it actually works. So during the pandemic, just look at efficacy. And then of course you look at what's my niche and building a brand, my advice has always been get on a goddamn airplane and fly there and show up in front of people so they can see you because that's how you connect. That's why my social engagement is still off the charts because a lot of people have seen me in person. You can't do that now. What that means is more of what we're doing right now. You better learn how to show up by the camera, learn how to show up, go to Joel Weldon's or whoever's favorite speaker training. Um, I, I'm sure that Ken has like tons of recommendations for that. Uh, and just learn how to stand up online and just bring it and don't bring what they want to hear bring what you believe is most important for them to hear. And if you're wrong, they'll tell you. But when they know you're real and they can feel that you're real online, you'll build a brand of people who are committed. You'll build a community, you'll build a following. And if you skip that step and just say, I'm going to have like a good font and I'm just going to like have a lot of followers, it's a hollow brand. And I don't recommend doing that. But number one, make sure your shit works, please. <laughs> the world doesn't need any more like garbage USB toasters. It's, it's not okay. Actually, mm -hmm. Thomas focuses on TikTok. He, uh, he, his two clients are TikTok and Instagram. Those are his clients. I love it. Yeah. So how much how much traffic to TikTok and Instagram? A billion? A billion they get a bunch. I, I don't get hundreds of millions every uh, month. Okay. So then you but, don't need training on how to show up for that. You're already but, successful, but, so but you're curious, teaching others. So like, I, I, I love learning from others because right now I'm working on building my own brand too. Like outside of the agency work, I'm trying to build like a brand where people use the product every day. But Thomas, so love Thomas, going. tell Dave what you were doing four years ago. Oh, I was working for my mom at the nail salon. So I was doing you need a sparkly fill. Can, can you help me out? <laughs> no, but think about it. Now he's running a multi-million dollar Dude. agency. I, a few I years think that's later. badass. He's kicking ass. Uh, I'm, and, and to do that in four years, uh, I, you need to tell that story, to be perfectly honest. I don't know what your daily habit is it a product, like a physical product or a digital thing? Yeah, I'm building like a fitness brand right now, All right. like an at-home fitness. So, so then your story is transformation, right? Like you can do anything and like, look at me. Like I worked in a nail salon for my mom and now I'm doing this now. And, and when you transform this, it transforms this and it transforms the world around you. And so you do this, not because you want to you know, get swole and fine, getting swole is great, but you do this because you want to own this. Right, and the whole hack your health language set, upgrade yourself is original core bulletproof, but you can riff on that idea. And for the TikTok generation, it's all about power and control. And, and like, look, your manifestation of how you build everything in your life starts inside and then that's why they do it. And then you have like a powerful thing and then you have a community around people who care that much. That's how I'd, I'd riff on that. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you. I love these young guys. Let's actually go to another young metal member. Stuart, go for it. What's your question for Dave Asprey? Yeah, hey Dave. I'm just wondering how, how you internalize new uh, game changers. Like what's your process for that? And how do you make sure you stay consistent with it? Game changers as people or ideas? Just so I understand what you're asking. Um, well, I was thinking more ideas, like just in terms of new habits, but even people as well, possibly. It, it turns out there's a secret to this. Um, after a while, your bullshit detector for who's a good filter gets programmed, right? So I read a huge amount and I like to think I'm a really good filter, but over the course of years, I have built up some amazing good filter friends. You know, some of them are well-known authors, some of the people you'd never know, but you know, they, they're just... Uh, masters of their field. And when one of those people sends me a note and says, Dave, you should pay attention to this. I'm like, thank you. You did my work for me. So I have like a 90% chance that this is a game changer or it's a piece of a game changer. And then I can riff and synthesize. 
So I rely on external filters. And sadly, when Facebook changed their, their algorithm about three, four years ago, I almost quit using Facebook because I used to have all of it would just come to me on my Facebook algorithm because people would post a link and they talk about it. And then they gave me pictures of puppies again and I quit using it except to communicate with fans. So your, your thing there is to do that. And the other one is you got to pick your area. So for me, like, like, making more energy in the body, cognitive function, anti-aging. I've spent 20 years studying those. I love those. But, and that means I can be a filter and I can really dig in. But if it's something else, like a financial thing, you just hire it, right? Like literally, I, I shouldn't be the guy to, to, to be the game changer idea there. I should ask two or three other people. So I just interviewed like Jay Abraham about that. Um, and you know, for some of the learning stuff where I go for brain function, not learning hacks, Jim Quick with his book Limitless just came out. So Jim was on my show. So you need a stable of trusted experts like coaches to make you better. My game, the reason I wrote the book Game Changers, I interviewed 500 people, some Nobel Prize. Like you guys teach me, like you be my filters. And then I statistically analyze it. That's look how. who's in this room right now. There's Game Changers on this call right now. You know, there you go talking about yourself again, Ken. I tell no, you. No, no, no. I mean, I'm looking like Rob Angel. Rob who's right here. He created Pictionary. You want to talk about launching a game. Shaheen Jahan, he understands everything about Amazon. He's one of the best Amazon hackers in the world. Eric Rice, who created a product called Quanta, is all around ingredients, in intensifying the impotency of ingredients using quantum technology to do it. I mean, we have game changers right here, right now. It's amazing, Stuart. It's good to have you as a member. And Dave, pay closer attention to us. Don't neglect us. I always pay attention to you. You I just do you, things buddy. on Saturday when I'm playing with my 10 year old. I know, and I appreciate that. <laughs> hey, can we talk about how there are certain fillers and different ingestible, or let's, let's go with the uh, nootropics that are dangerous. And one real quick is black pepper. You know, black pepper pisses me off. Yeah. Uh, black pepper is, is a very high aflatoxin food. And you might've heard of aflatoxin in that it's, uh, it's the most cancer causing substance that we know of right now. And it's a toxin that's formed by mold. And it, it definitely causes problems. So a lot of black pepper has that issue. But even if you get black pepper that doesn't have storage problems in it, a little bit of it probably won't hurt you. But when you concentrate it or you do a lot of it or you're trying to use it in a supplement or putting a, a lot of it, like crusting things with it, it pokes holes in your stomach lining the same way that gluten does for a lot of people and it lets everything leak through. So using you know, black pepper, adding it to your diet because it's somehow gonna amplify the effect of turmeric, it's just junk science. Like black pepper is a spice, black pepper essential oil has some usefulness, uh, but if you're using a lot of it or using it to try and put it in your supplements to, to put things through your gut lining, it will take every bad thing in your stomach and put it in your blood. Well, they use so, it as an accelerant, don't they? Yeah, it's called piperine, and it's an extract of black pepper, that stuff, Everything in your gut will get pushed into your blood from it. It is not good for you. Who cares if it raises the level, level of whatever you take with it? It, it? it raises everything. So I will not put that in my supplements. And I tell people, stay clear of anything that has that. And by the way, guys, the reason why I bring this up is some of you are asking about different ingestibles you should be going after to have cognitive enhancement. Some of them put black pepper in it. And they're making it as if it's a benefit to have it. It's actually a horrible thing to have. It, it is sold by the company who makes the extract as a benefit, but the studies on PubMed show that it increases permeability of the gut lining. And like, here's Chuck. He's saying, I use a lot of black pepper with turmeric. The amount of black pepper in your turmeric does zero for you, zero benefit for you. You need to have an extract. It's like a, it's like a whole pound of black pepper or something, or you know, half a pound into a little bit to get that effect. So all the herbalists who say, oh, black pepper and turmeric, it's just like fantasy work. It, it's just, it doesn't work. Um, they they claim it to like it. help with absorption. That's what they claim it to do. Yeah, it absorbs all of the, the lipopolysaccharide toxins made by your gut bacteria, all the other um, undigested proteins. <laughs> it does help with absorption. There's no lie there. <laughs> so let's now focus on something else. We have two guys in the room that their voice is their job. We have Roger Love and AJ Jackson and many of us who are public speakers. Dave, what do you suggest us to do to make sure our, our voice our, our projection, everything there is, is kept young. How do we hack our voices to make sure we always have young voice boxes and, 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 and make sure we keep that safe? You know, I probably am the wrong person to ask that. Okay. Um, there's basic biology around mitochondrial function and around having enough collagen to maintain flexibility. 
but I would want to talk with someone who's worked with professional singers or well, we got, we have the artists. best in the world, actually. Roger Love, who that's is, what I was thinking. Yeah, Roger, who is here. Roger, any suggestions on what we should do to make sure we're hacking our? Is Roger still here? I'm here. Oh, uh, to hack our, make sure we have a a constant, always happy, just vocal cords, voice, everything. How do we hack that to keep it young? Yeah, teach me that. Well, the, the first step is to realize that when you drink water, when you're on stage or you're doing a Zoom session and you think that that water somehow makes your vocal cords hydrated or your throat hydrated, it does not. All water that you drink goes down the food and liquid hole, but the vocal cords live down the air hole. So you have to drink so much water that all of the water that's necessary goes to the vital organs. And if there happens to be a little bit left, some of that water goes to the salivary glands, which creates the type of positive phlegm that you want to hydrate the cords. So you have to at least drink a half a gallon of water a day so that some water at all gets to the cords and keeps them moist. So that's not a solution then. <laughs> Is there any little hacks that you know of? Uh, the hacks is you should, you should be doing some kind of vocal exercises that allows you to go from lows to highs because as you move the vocal cords in the position as they go from low to high, even if you, if you, if you said something like, wee, or you went, ah, it doesn't even have to be a real exercise like I teach. Anything that moves the vocal cords from long and fat, fat to shorter and thinner makes the vocal, keeps the vocal cords more elasticized, starts strengthening the muscles of the larynx. And, you know, I'm, wor I'm working on a whole new system, which is scientifically already proven, that if you just did a, a 10 minutes of vocal exercises a day, like the ones I do, go, 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 that not only does it fix your breathing, but it also eliminates mild cases of, of sleep apnea. It also reduces snoring that there's all kinds of therapeutic effects now from just learning how to use our throat muscles and the way we make sounds. I like that. I want to hear you go goo, 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 goo. Come on, Dave. Goo, goo, goo. I, I tend to do this one. I go like, mm, and try to do the Yoda thing. Roger, am I doing that right? Because Yes, uh, um, although at the end, don't make it, don't go, mm, don't make that. I, I'm going to for just like, mm. But see, I get, I hit a little growly in there. So I, yeah, I need to work on that. The growly stuff, the growly stuff is making your vocal cords puffy and swollen. If you did it without the growl. Mm. See, I don't want to growl. I just, I just automatically do it because I used to be such a dick. It was just let, built in. Let me just bring in to, real quick. AJ Jackson, AJ is with uh, Van St. Motel. They're, they're trending like crazy. They open for Imagine Dragons and 21 Pilots. AJ is the nice. lead singer. AJ, what do you do for your voice to keep it young and, and, and fertile and beautiful? Well, first I want to say, Dave, you were the first medal I went to was you were speaking at the theater. Oh, wow. <laughs> I was immediately blown away and I was like, I have to be a part of this group. Um, but I, I do kind of like uh, cereal jingles as warm up. So like backstage, you'll hear me going like, they're great. And Kawaki nice. Chris, like, um, you know, just like Roger's saying, really moving your voice, your voice up and down is, is great in any kind of way we do. Soul trains, like soul train kind of thing. That's um, so cool. Soul. And soul I feel like I have breaks in there. I think, Roger, I got to make an appointment with you. Oh, yeah. uh, oh yeah. and I, I'm, I'm just going to share this because I'm a dork. Um, I've sucked at singing my entire life. I have zero skills whatsoever. Uh, so I decided as soon as uh, I moved uh, about 45 minutes away where I'm in a city where there's actually people, I'm going to have someone come over twice a week and give me singing lessons well, so that I, I can actually I can learn beat, how to sing just for I, fun. That's all, that's all good, but I can beat that. Why don't we just do a Zoom lesson Seriously? next week? Okay. But, but Roger, Roger in. tell them what actor you taught to sing. The latest big actor that I'm getting... Uh, praise for is I taught Bradley Cooper how to sing. For no him, shit, that was you. The movie A Star Is Born. Yeah, exactly. I heard all the training. That was you who trained him, Roger. I, I'm going to talk with you. All right, seriously, I want to learn how to sing Hallelujah well enough to kick everyone's ass. That's my goal. It's just a little goal. All right. I love well enough to bring I mean, people to the Lord. That's it. Go. He's also taught all the people on Glee. Have you ever saw that show? No. That's Roger. Roger's the best in the world. We only have right. the best here. Roger, we're doing it over Skype. 
Uh, and that's a date, Dave. There you yeah. go. All right, so guys, I wanna make sure we got that to give. Hey, uh, we're, we're gonna go into this whole fasting area. You're saying fasting is necessary, is that correct, Dave? We have to fast. To if you wanna live a long time food? and perform really well, look, here's the deal. When you lift something heavy, your body says, oh, I don't really wanna lift it, and you go shut up, and you lift it, and it makes you stronger. And when you tell your body, you're gonna go for a day without food, and you go, because I said so, it does all sorts of positive metabolic things, but it's about the willpower. Like who's in charge here, right? Yeah. So you wanna, you wanna be able to do big things in the world. If a big thing is put down the chocolate chip cookie for a while, if you can't do that, like who's running what? And so the, that's why you do I'm, it. I'm going to you. you, we actually call you Big Paul. And I don't <laughs> think you wanna be known as Big Paul because of your bigness, but how do we get Big Paul into shape? What do we do here, Dave? All right, Big Paul, how big are we? I'm looking for which, where are you on the screen? Right here. Right. There you are. All right, see, so you got an extra pound or two. Yeah. All right, well, you got an extra 150 or so? Probably the extra 200. Extra 200, all right. So, you want to do it If fast? everyone, honestly, if everyone was to guess how much they think, think I weigh, I, pr I promise you no one would get, get it right. Just looking at me and everyone who doesn't know me in metal, how much do you think I weigh, people, right now? I just weighed myself this morning. How tall are you? Six four. Oh, dude, you're three forty. Off. No. Next. See, I could win. Bar, I could win money at bar. Okay, bar we're not going to do a circus no, thing here. But no, real you, quick, I, I, I'm four eighteen. Four eighteen. Wow. Damn. All right. So, what you want to do is you want to do. Actually, I'll send you if you give me your address. I'll send you the bulletproof diet. Like that. People losing a million pounds is not a joke. People losing hundred pounds I've lost track of the number of people who do it without the hunger stuff. Right. And if yeah. you've got some emotional eating going on there, you probably know it at some level and we got to address that and hypnotism will do it. Neurofeedback will do it. EMDR will do it. But what's probably going on is your body's like, I'm hungry all the time because the nutrients aren't getting in and something's going on and my blood sugar's fluctuating. And for that thing, every morning when you wake up, do a bulletproof coffee, and it needs to have 40 grams of protein along with it in the first half hour after you wake up. And you got to do this for at least two months and maybe up to six months. You have a couple eggs, you have some smoked salmon, but no carbs in the morning whatsoever. Um, you do that, it's going to reset your hunger levels and it's going to reset your fat set point to on a regular basis to, to where it should be using it's something that ketones do. And these are ketones from brain octane. And if you want to lose it really fast, there's a, on my blog, daveasprey.com, it's called the Rapid Fat Loss Protocol. It's not in my books. And I've had people lose a pound a day for 75 days on that diet. Um, it's, it's intense and you need to do everything I say precisely because you run the risk of just releasing toxins. Your body's storing fat or storing toxins in that fat. You, you lose hundred pounds of fat, you get hundred pounds of toxins. You gotta get those out along the way. Uh, and if you wanna send me a note, my email's in here, Dave at Bulletproof Media. I'll, um, send, it. Actually, I'll, uh, I'll send you the book. Big Paul's a big beacon in metal, meaning um, we, a lot of guys follow him because of his, his, his music expertise, his creativity, his, his, just the way who he is. He's very inspirational. And Dave, if you can help him out, just a little extra, maybe send him a care package. I'd appreciate it. Okay. Okay. I'm just saying because uh, just, we'll, we'll, how it'll you. affect him will affect all of us. Send, send me your, uh, send me all your contact info. I'll, I'll get you hooked up. And uh, if we need to do a call or something, yeah. um, there's probably some lab tests. My guess is you're low on thyroid and testosterone too. And uh, once you get on those, so you have the levels of uh, thyroid makes, it's your energy thermostat. You should have the thyroid and testosterone levels of a 27 year old. And it's amazing how much easier it is to lose weight there. And then there's a few other hacks like that. But honestly, if you were to do eat on the, the roadmap, the Bulletproof Diet Roadmap, and do the coffee thing in the morning, and you just do that consistently, you'll lose a few pounds a week, probably more than that because I have a lot to lose, and it just keeps going and going and going. Um, but set aside a budget for new pants. I noticed that you mentioned food, but not exercise. Exercise is 20%, 10%, something like that. It's all about the food. Exercise is not how you lose weight. Man, I'm still pissed. When I weighed 300 pounds and I went to the gym, 45 minutes of cardio on, on an incline wearing a vest and maxing out all but two of the machines at the gym for every day, six days a week for 18 months, I still weighed 300 pounds and I still was a 46 inch waist. Exercise gives you a little bit of extra muscle. It helps, but it's not the secret. The secret is you're eating stuff that makes you inflamed. And you know that's what it is. It's probably not even eating too much. Yeah. All right. Hey, let's talk about uh, the CP, uh, your your consumer packaging side and let's talk about the retail side. 
I'm walking around in Arizona last couple of days and I see all of your stuff everywhere. Your bars are there, your coffee. Thank it you. seems like the brand has exploded. What was that little oomph that took you to that next level? This is going to take a minute or two to, to answer, but I think it's worth all of you hearing this stuff. Well, first from an executive team, what gets you, you gets you here won't get you there. So I've had to go through three and probably like my fourth rev of the executive team because the guys that get you to 5 million are not going to get you to 25. They don't have the experience. And when you get past the 25 to 50, so there's constant evolution of the executive team and, and feeling like you can't lose someone who's you know, near and dear to you personally and to the company and realizing that, that you know, they, they reach their peak and, and evolving them out is important. But a lot of consumer and content driven brands. And um, you know, this, is, uh, this is really important um, if you're building like a health brand, like we were talking about earlier, you can hit about 40 million with a core community. And after that, you're gonna have to expand out. And what most brands do is they say, I need other distribution. And the second you do that, uh, um, so you're out of your core community, your CAC goes way up as an e-commerce company. And then it starts to get really interesting to go into retail. Now, who knows what retail is going to look like in the future or if there is such a thing, but I'm pretty sure it's going to come back because people like to go to the grocery store for food. So uh, whether or not it's food might make a difference. But the big pop there was, I said, all right, where can I get $10 million sales instead of you know, an average cart size of 100 bucks or something? And well, okay, let's go to Whole Foods. And pretty soon 60% of my business is doing that. And I'm like, oh crap, now I got to hire a CEO out of big food. So you know, Bulletproof is, is doing very well because I hired an executive who knows how to run the business that I'm in today, even though I'm a you know, visionary creative content guy and I'm gonna tell you what matters because it really matters. I'm gonna make the cool stuff, but that isn't gonna get us to hundred million. So it's having those mindsets to know how much do you spend on shopper marketing and building a company so that your management team accepts, okay, new, new leadership's coming in, new people are coming in. Um, those, are, those are really big things. But for me, it was making the transition from um, this mission-driven community thing, which we still are, uh, but to go into large, we're in Walmart, we're in Costco, we're in Target and places like that. And knowing how to run that business is different than the business I was in before. And then how about uh, Bulletproof, the coffee shops itself? It doesn't seem like they've exploded as much as the, the brand itself inside you know, it, it, it's interesting. I'm, uh, I transitioned out as CEO and I'm chairman. I'm actually selling a small amount of my uh, founder's shares uh, to raise money for some other projects, including the Bulletproof Coffee Shop. So that company has been like less than 1% of revenue for Bulletproof or whatever, 2%, something like that. So it's a redheaded stepchild at a, at a you know, large consumer packaged goods focused company. So it's, I, I spun it out. It's separate from the company entirely. So I'm putting a lot of my energy in on that. And I'll probably after the pandemic and we know what the impact is and you know, whether restaurants are even viable, um, I'll be expanding that. I'm opening one up here in Victoria underneath my office. So I'll have something to eat uh, and that's going to be a big test bed, but I'm planning to make that thing big next. Um, but I'm going to raise some funding for that. How about the after. labs? Thanks. How about labs? Um, labs is, is in with the coffee shop. So labs and the coffee shop are in the same company right now. My labs company, man, we're hurting. You have to lay everyone off when the government closes you. Right? So I'm running on a very small skeleton team. I'm waiting until we can open up. We're allegedly opening up the, either this coming week or right now. So I've rehired some of the people, but if you're a gym, a restaurant and an events company all in one, you know, we just got handed a big pile of steaming, you know what, from, uh, from California there. So all of those, I think, will go when things come back. Uh, and I'm balancing that one carefully. But the main company, I'm, you know, raising, raising a little bit for it. And uh, um, I would, like, we've beat our numbers every month for the last 10 months, including straight through the pandemic. So it's a good time for Bulletproof. Hey, can everybody unmute themselves? And let's all thank Dave Asprey for hanging out with us, everyone. Let's Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much. Happy to see you all. So Ken, thanks for not doing it on Saturday morning. Thanks, <laughs> Give it up for Dave. Thanks, Dave. In a metal open house. Wait, wait. Another metal open house.